thank you, and uh, sorry for the flicker. I hope you can manage to see the slides anyway. Who here um, knows what Yelp is? Oh, that's actually, <clears throat> sorry, actually quite a few people, so I'll be quick. Um, well, Yelp, uh, Yelp's mission is about uh, to connect uh, people with great local businesses. Uh, we have a website, an app, and a mobile website. Um, we have uh, 142 million uh, unique active um, visitors monthly. We have 77 million reviews by those um, users. And we are available in over 30 countries. We most recently launched in the Philippines. Um, and we're not only for finding like great restaurants and bars, but also like great doctors, uh, great shops, and any other kind of local business. Uh, we also have, this is probably like less known, we have Yelp for business owners. So if you're a business owner, you can come to Yelp, you can claim your business, you can mark it as your own, um, and you can then measure visitor activity on your Yelp page, you can interact with customers. So if customers leave a review for your business, um, you can reply to that in public or in private, and you can upload photos for your business and uh, do a bunch of uh, other things. So who am I? I'm a backend developer uh, for the Biz Owner app. Um, I worked on the main Yelp app backend before that. Uh, I'm a Python user since 2008. I started doing a lot of Django work back then before switching to application and now um, mobile development. So uh, let's take a look at why we're going to, um, okay, that's already not good. There's supposed to be an image there <laughs> um, uh, about Yelp. Um, let's take a look. We were founded in 2004 and actually like one of the co-founders, uh, Jeremy Stoppelman is still running um, the, um, the company is our CEO. Uh, and all of our code was in a central repository we called um, Yelp Main, um, which means the code for the website, including templates, the mobile web, the mobile backend, and the business owner site, all in one um, repository, which means um, we had a lot of homegrown code. Um, and um, as people worked on it and they introduced new abstractions, they didn't remove the old ones and it was hard to reason about the code, do these big refactorings. So as Yelp grew and we are still growing, we're still hiring people, this started um, to become a bottleneck. We actually like at one point we had um, three different ways to do um, SQL statements or execute SQL statements in Yelp main. That was not nice. Um, so yeah, we cannot uh, really refactor all the code and um, I want to dig deeper into another area that really highlights um, our bottleneck. Um, I'm really sorry, like, I think I need to reload this. Just a minute. <sighs> okay. Um, Really sorry about this. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um. <laughs> Just a minute. Okay, <laughs> sorry about all of this. Um, yeah, so we had a lot of homegrown code. Um, finally, we see the images. This is what Yelp looked like back then. Um, we have a lot of, um, yeah, abstractions. I talked about that. Uh, so let's talk about the push process, which is what we call when we deploy um, Yelp code. 
Um, we do deploy Yelp code several times a day. Um, this is done by a push master, which is an engineer that has production system access. Um, people um, take their code changes, their code review changes, they want to push to production and they join a push and then the push master runs uh, this push. We have like several tools to um, assist us in doing this. Uh, you see a screenshot of push manager, which is actually open source. Um, where we manage the pushes and people can say, hey, I want to join this push and I want to um, push my changes to production. And as you can hopefully see, it's not that clear. There's like a small red bar next to my push. Um, I, I ran um, and it's red, which means this push didn't make it to production. Um, we had to abandon it and I'm going to talk a bit out about why this might happen. So when we run a push, at first uh, there are some automatic checks that take all changes, build a deployment branch where they merge all the changes in. Uh, that deployment branch is then, yeah, well deployed to a stage system. Um, and then after manual verification, so all people that joined this push, they need to be present, they need to verify that their changes work on the stage system. And if everything is okay, our test suite, uh, we are happy with our test suite runs, uh, then we send this branch to production. We do the same thing. We watch production for um, a certain amount of time. Um, and if we are happy, the push gets certified, the changes get merged into master. And starting from that, the changes are live and um, we're done. People, when they branch off and they start to work on a new change, they will branch off of these changes. This is a two hour process with really no upper bound. Um, why no upper bound? Because like if we find problems, let's say on the stage system, we need to take out the problematic change, rebuild the deployment branch, put it again on stage system, run our test suites, go again to production and so on and so on until we have a new code version that is good and that we can uh, leave on production. You see here a screenshot, this is actually like another tool that helps us during the push um, where you can see um, which um, hosts in our data centers are already running the new version of the code. This is the green bars. Which um, hosts in the data centers are running the old version of the code, which is the red bars and the yellow bars are the hosts that are in the process of bouncing, so switching to the new code version. I have to say like our release engineering team, they are hard at work in like optimizing this pro uh, process. They're really um, like making it better and better, more automatic, but still it uh, was obvious that like this doesn't scale. Uh, you can run only so many pushes a day and um, uh, the more people join Yelp and we are still growing, um, the harder it becomes to have like a push without issues. So um, some, uh, yeah intelligent minds sat uh, together at Yelp and they thought about a solution and they found one. Uh, I don't think we are the first uh, company that came up with this solution, but it's um, yeah, kind of obvious we need to modularize. Um, we are uh, at a certain size where you can uh, not work with a single code base. You can only run so many pushes a day, as I just said. Um, and even if you increase the number of pushes, the number of people that develop at Yelp also increases. So. Yeah, you will run into problems uh, eventually. So let's uh, build services. How do services solve this problem? Well, each service is um, developed and deployed independently, so you don't actually need to uh, know about this huge code base. Uh, you just need to know about your service. Um, service pushes are very easy and very quick. Um, people can do it themselves um, after like a short training. Uh, services um, o usually only cover like one aspect or one set of features, um, which also makes it very easy to like introduce new technologies, to refactor code, uh, reduce technical debt, all that kind of thing. Um, and it's um, actually, it might even bring some performance benefits uh, since um, when you have like this big monolithic code base in Python, it's not that easy to parallelize things, right? So um, when you switch to a service-oriented architecture, even though at first you might think, hey, like I'm doing network requests instead of like function calls, this should be slower. It might 
it actually faster than before if you do those requests asynchronously at the same time and just wait for the longest uh, result. Uh, we actually also um, wrote like uh, Yelp service principles. It's like a list of do and don'ts for services, uh, our reasoning about services, our thoughts. Uh, go check it out, it's on, on GitHub. Yeah, so why might we not want to do services? Um, because, well, chaos might ensue. Like, I actually stole this from Hat, uh, Fred Hatful, like a colleague of mine. Uh, he also um, gave a talk about services. You can find it online. It's really good. Um, well, um, why not services? Consistency is really hard. It's actually like non-existent. There is no such thing as a transaction over like several service calls. Um, you don't have a clear dependency or usage graph. Um, so which means you need to maintain your interfaces, your API forever, since you don't know who is going to use it and for how long. Um, it also means like that testing like one huge self-contained code base, it's easy. It might not be simple, but it's easy. Um, but how do you test your loosely coupled services which are out there? So this is uh, the chaos I was talking about. How do you make sure stuff doesn't break? Um, unit tests, everybody loves unit tests, or at least many people do, but in my opinion, they are great, but they are not enough. Since in a world of loosely coupled services, a breakage uh, many times occurs at the interface level. So like some service you call, it subtly changes its interface, its API, uh, the developers maybe didn't even intend to, and uh, yes, your call breaks, the answer is not that what you expected it to be, and this is a huge problem. Um, what's our solution to that? Our solution is acceptance tests. So instead of mocking, either like with unit tests at the function level or further out, we don't do any mocking. Uh, we run all the code from the request as it comes in, through all services we might call, back the whole workflow, and then we test the response we get and make sure it's what we want it to be. Um, it's as close to production as possible without like setting up your own dedicated stage environment. Um, and it's, um, yeah, what we do at, at Yelp. Um, so we put all the components, the services, anything else you need uh, in Docker images. We spin up those Docker containers. We use production code for these containers. Um, and we use Docker Compose, it's, it was previously called Fig, um, to manage these, uh, these infrastructure. Uh, it's a bit heavyweight, so it takes a long time to run. Not the test itself, that's actually fairly quick, but like spinning up all those Docker containers, um, setting everything up, uh, that takes quite some time. Um, and it actually grows with the number of services you have, obviously. Like, so you call more services, so your acceptance testing setup has to grow accordingly. Um, yeah, so it's a bit heavyweight, but um, we are really happy with uh, the results since it gives you a certain amount of confidence in your changes because you can say, yeah, this is going to work in production. Um, so just an example of uh, what this might look like. Um, this is part of the acceptance testing setup for the biz owner app backend. So we have some configs. We have the main uh, biz app definition where you can see under links, this is like all the dependencies we have, all the direct dependencies. Those are like several different um, services within Yelp. Internal API is actually like the service front end of Yelp main, so that's like our legacy code base. And you can see on the right, that one itself has a bunch of dependencies, so that's how your uh, acceptance testing uh, setup grows. Yeah, but as I said, um, it can be a bit cumbersome also like setting up test data because some services have their own data store. So when you uh, create your test fixtures, you need to make sure like all services are like in sync, have the same data so your tests work. But overall, um, we're pretty happy with it. So now that we know why we do services and how we make sure um, they don't break randomly, what's our service stack? We originally started with Tornado, but that um, did not uh, work out quite as well as we hoped. Um, so our current stack uh, is Pyramid, just the latest version of Pyramid, with uh, uWhiskey and SQL Alchemy, 
and um, it works out quite well. Uh, we use HTTP, obviously, as transport protocol, JSON for the data format, and um, one very important block of our service stack is Swagger, which is an API framework, so with Swagger you specify your API, you write actually JSON to specify your API, um, and there's a bunch of tools included. One of them is uh, Swagger UI, which helps you visualize uh, the API you just defined. This is what it looks like um, for, for a random service at Yelp. I think this is business media. Um, so you see your methods get and post, you see the endpoint, you see the request parameters your service expects or that endpoint expects the uh, data model you're, you're, you will get as a response. Um, so you can browse and find all the um, endpoints you might need for uh, your work. Swagger does more. Um, it also does request and response validation optionally, but I would encourage you to, uh, to activate that since it makes sure like your request parameters are there and in the specified type as, as specified in the spec. Your response is actually um, fits what we saw here in the data model. Um, it uh, does data structure and basic type checking on individual field level. Um, and it works dynamically by reading um, a services spec. So there's um, a library called Brevado. It was called uh, SwaggerPy. It's open source. Um, we, uh, it's on GitHub, on our GitHub account. Um, and it like dynamically reads the spec and generates your stub so you can like do function calls or method calls in Python which actually do the um, HTTP requests. Um, and we used to do that with client libraries which was quite painful. So say you wanted to develop a new endpoint uh, for your service, you would do that. Then you would check out the client library, you would generate um, the stub code for that new endpoint, you would commit that after it went through code review, you would bump the client library version number and only then when people upgraded to the new client library, they could use your new endpoint. All of this uh, Swagger, Pi, or Bravado takes care of it uh, for us and it makes it uh, really nice to work with it. So let's talk a bit about a specific service, the BizApp service, which is um, the service that powers our BizOwner app uh, clients, Android and iOS clients. It's a bit of a special snowflake since it's one of the very few services at Yelp you can reach from the outside. Usually they, you can only reach them from the internal network. Um, it's also, unlike other services, it's not constrained to like one set of features or one area. It contains the whole API for our um, app clients. Um, and it has no local data store. So actually many services have their own data store, we don't. So oftentimes we are just a proxy, we are calling other services, we are calling Yelp main, we are aggregating data and returning, uh, formatting it, enriching it and returning it uh, to our clients. So how does our mobile API look like? Well, it's, it's a RESTy API, right? One resource per endpoint, do multiple calls uh, to fetch related resources, blah, blah, blah. You probably already know all of this. And this is how we develop services at Yelp, but not how you do a mobile API. Because you are over a cellular network, you want to be as efficient as possible and you want to do as few calls as possible. So what we do is we have one endpoint per client app page. So for every page um, your app displays, we just want it to do, if possible, just one network request and send it all the data it needs. Um, for post endpoints, whenever like you, you want to save something from the client, we not only acknowledge that the write happened successfully, but we also send the client back all data it might need for follow-up pages to display that. This is quite different from uh, our, yeah, lower level service APIs that really are more resty. So you can say that, um, yeah, we aggregate, um, we do like many service calls for, typically many service calls for one um, client request we get and we just aggregate and send data back and yeah, act as a proxy. Um, so what does it mean to develop a mobile app um, backend. Um, I come from web development. I imagine uh, some of you do as well. Turns out mobile apps have releases. Uh, in our case, for the 
is on our app, they are synchronized, so we release Android and iOS at the same time with the same set of features. Um, and iOS apps need to be reviewed, as you might have heard. <laughs> and uh, this actually takes quite some time. I remember it, like, it used to be like five days. Nowadays, I think our longest review time was 11 days. I think it's back to about nine days. So that's actually like quite a long time. And you probably want to test the whole thing before you release it. And in this case, releasing means submitting it to review to Apple. So our API needs to be done sooner than the client implementation, and which means it needs to be done way sooner than when the app is released, so when you can download it on your phone. How else is it different than uh, web development? You cannot upgrade the client whenever you upgrade the server. In fact, some clients never upgrade. Like we still have a tiny portion of users on the 1.0 release for the BizOwner app, which we released late last year. So unless you want to drop support for those um, users, you need to support your API forever, which means you cannot do backwards incompatible changes. How do we deal with that? We do a multi-version API. So we have the same endpoint with a different version. In this case, we append the version at the end, and we do maintain and test all versions to make sure they still work. This is obviously, it costs something, it costs effort, so maintaining multiple versions, we don't want to do that needlessly. So what are the ways we can uh, think of to make sure we don't have to do multiple versions all the time? It turns out if you just add data to the response, that's backwards compatible. Our clients, they will just ignore it, the legacy clients, the old clients. And our response validation, what Swagger does for you, it's also smart enough to just ignore additional data. It just makes sure that the data as it's defined in the spec is there. And once we um, develop on the server and we add that new field, we also add it to the spec. So actually our response will be, um, it will be okay, it will validate, right? So this is what it looks like. This is an example out of a JSON spec for an API. And you see the green part, we just added one field, time zone, uh, type string with a description. And we could do that without having to do any other change to that file. So obviously, like we didn't introduce a new version endpoint, um, it would just work. So how do we make sure it actually does work in production? Well, we do some monitoring. Um, we monitor the number of requests, the server errors, uh, task queues, send push notifications. Here are some examples. This is a tool, like an older tool. Um, you can almost not see it, where we look at uh, the types of errors that happened at the rate of errors. We now have like a bunch of nice Kibana 4 dashboards where you can like actually do almost anything you want. Uh, we send a bunch of our metrics to signal effects so you can build nice dashboards. You can visualize them, analyze them. And we use ElastAlert, which is a really nice open source tool. Um, we open sourced, I think, last year. Uh, you should really check it out. It's very easy to set up your own alerts um, so you know whenever something is wrong. For app crashes, so whenever our client apps crash, we use Crashlytics, both on Android and iOS. Um, and as soon as you reach a certain size, you probably need an on-call rotation, so you need to wake up people whenever things break. Uh, we use PagerDuty for that. We have integrated ElastAlert into PagerDuty, so for severe errors, we get paged. We have integrated Crashlytics, so if our app crashes spike, we get paged. Yeah, that's um, basically already um, about it. I want to just um, mention another talk if you are interested in services. Uh, Scott Trillia is going to hold another, um, uh, give another talk about services, arrested development, surviving the awkward adolescence of a microservices-based application. That was hard. Um, it's Friday, 11 a.m. in the Python Anywhere room. Go check it out. Um, it's really a great talk. Also some 
other shameless plugs we are hiring. So if that sounded interesting to you, uh, check out yelp.com slash careers. And uh, even if you don't find like your ideal uh, job opening, uh, contact me or contact us on our booth. Um, we will figure something out. We are always looking for uh, talented people. We actually have offices in Hamburg, Germany. This is where I work, also in London, um, and obviously in San Francisco. Yeah, we also have uh, an engineering hub where we aggregate our blog posts. We have our open source efforts documented there and more. We are on Twitter. Um, and last but not least, this is a fun one. I urge you to check it out, the Yelp Dataset Challenge. Um, if you ever wanted to do some data analysis but you didn't have data or you didn't know what to do, uh, go look that up. Uh, the last one just ended, but uh, the new one will probably start uh, like before the end of summer. Go check the website, it will be announced there. And the deadline will be sometime by the end of the year. Um, yeah, it's a lot of fun and you might actually even um, win some money. So that's all. Thank you very much. Uh, sorry for the technical difficulties. And yeah, if you have any questions, just ask. Hey, um, can you talk a bit more about your aggregator? Like, is it something open source? Do you plan to open source it? Or uh, is it a process on its own? Or is it a web server module? Or how does it work? A aggregating what? Uh, for your APIs. Well, you, you say, like, you have an aggregator for making only one request uh, and, and um, to not. Uh, and one request per page and not yeah. 10 requests for everything. That's basically like what our biz app service does. So when, when a client, an, an app makes a request, uh, HTTPS request to our service, it hits to our servers, it hits our service, and our service does everything it needs to like satisfy that request. So it will do multiple service calls, aggregate the data, collect it from different services from Yelp main, put it together, uh, fetch related data, everything the client needs, and then send that back to the client in JSON um, over HTTPS. So actually like our service, this is like what we develop is the aggregator and does all of this. And um, yeah, and sometimes like when we want to aggregate that data, there is like I mentioned this internal API interface into Yelp main. Sometimes there is no interface for the data we need. So actually, we will also be developing that interface and then use it to fetch and aggregate the data. Um, I have actually two questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, what was the problem with Tornado? <laughs> I'm um, just curious. Yeah, I was fearing that uh, issue might come up. I was actually not at Yelp when, uh, when this was uh, tried out. Um, you might try to ask Scott about it. I don't know if he knows. You can also come to our booth. Uh, there are other people we can ask. Honestly, I, can, I cannot tell you. I just know that it didn't work out well, and now we are really happy with Pyramid. Okay, and uh, the second question is, uh, how do you handle logging in the Docker containers? Um, yeah, that is an issue. Uh, we do logging, it's, it's done inside the Docker containers. We expose the, um, uh, the logging folders as volumes, so you can actually like start another Docker container and mount uh, those volumes from the individual Docker containers and look at the logs okay, if thanks. necessary. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, can you comment more um, uh, on uh, your development process, because I can imagine that testing, uh, it's a huge overhead. So do you have separate team that makes the uh, um, testing or does every developer is able to set up uh, the whole infrastructure with Dockers? How does it work? Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, yes, every developer is supposed to not only write the code, but also write the test. So typically, like the development processes, you, you create a branch uh, from within Git, right? You do your development. Once you're ready, you post um, your changes for code review. Other developers review the code, and hopefully, if they pay attention, um, 
and you did a change without adding tests for that change, they will say, hey, like you should write a test for that. The developer then decides, well, is a unit test enough? Do I need an acceptance test? But yes, every developer is able to run the whole test suite on their local machine uh, and then run the test. Yes. So um, actually, like um, when I say local machine, we, we have something called developer playground where you look, log into a machine where you do your actual work on and it has like everything ready for you to run the test. So Docker is installed, everything is there. We have our own local Docker registry. So it will just, yes, run the tests and uh, you can write them and run them by yourself. Hi, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, I just have a basic question. How do your services communicate actually? I uh, didn't get this. You mean us in San Francisco? So, um, no, your internal services because you said you have a modular structure and... Yes. So it's just HTTP calls um, with yeah JSON data exchange. So that's basically how they all communicate unless it's like something very special. Thank you. You mentioned the acceptance tests. When you do deploys, um, do you do any locking to avoid uh, two deploys of uh, services that are required in the acceptance tests? So if, if one service depends on service B and both this service and B, once they want to be deployed, what do you do then? Ah, yeah, okay. That's like, since it's so loosely coupled, um, either you have to pay like real good attention or you cannot do that. So each service is considered independent. So um, if you need like um, a deployment or you have a deployment of your service and it needs to um, have some other changes in other services before you can do that deployment, you, you just, you as a developer, as an owner of that service, you need to make sure you don't deploy too early. Um, usually like when we do a deploy, the whole test suite is run as the first thing, even before we go to stage. So hopefully if you have good test coverage, you would like notice then that things are not there. But generally it's your responsibility since we have loose coupling that you don't deploy breaking changes to other services, that you remain backwards compatible, and that if you depend on changes from other services, that you do the deployment in the right order. Okay, thank you. Hi, thank you for the talk. Uh, so, uh, can you please cl clarify what is the problem with testing services? So, you said that each service has a specification. There is some tooling around it, like Swagger, which uh, verifies that search server response uh, matches the specification. And so, there is service A, which depends on service B. And why cannot just service A expect that service B is always producing valid responses? And it looks like you don't really need to run a request through all the services around and uh, with the production version of service B for that? Yes, um, great question. So it's mainly about the human factor. So um, we don't have the tooling in place to check for this automatically. Basically, our acceptance tests are that tooling to make sure a new service deployment doesn't break anything. It, it has happened in the past multiple times. Um, I actually remember once that a service got deployed, which then broke something inside Yelp main because Yelp main called that service because the developers, they just didn't think of the fact that this small change uh, was actually not backwards compatible. Um, since we don't have something like as rigid to make like sure, hey, you, you cannot deploy a change that's not backwards compatible, we have to write tests for that, and that's basically our our check for that. Hi, uh, thanks for the good presentation. Um, if I understood correctly, you have a mobile API, like an API specific to mobile applications. Uh, have you ever considered uh, having different, slightly different uh, structure or information returned to different types of devices, like 
different for Android and iOS? Uh, yes, we actually do that for uh, our, what we call consumer apps. So basically the apps you would download on your device. Um, we not only might do that depending on device type, but also depending on the version of the app you run and other factors. So yes, yes, we do that. Uh, up until now, uh, we, will, we have been able to get away with just different version endpoints and sending generally the same data both to Android and iOS, but we are in the process of actually developing something similar for the BizOwner app as well. Uh, doesn't it make uh, testing your API uh, more complicated? Oh, much more complicated. It's, um, it's like basically any of these checks is like another branch in your code. So yes, that's why we are trying to avoid that as much as possible. Yeah, completely agree. Thanks. Okay, I think one more, okay. Hey, thanks for the talk. So, uh, question is, uh, you had a Yelp main, and what's the definition of reasons, like how you recognize that you need to decouple this main uh, from service? I mean, how you recognize service first? Like, what's the definition of first, uh, service first? Well, we try to put, like, any new code we write, if it's reasonable, we try to put it inside in service, and then use that from Yelp main or wherever um, to decouple our code. There are also efforts going on in taking code which is already in Yelp main, extracting it and putting it into services just so our development speed can increase. Ramping up new developers actually becomes much faster since code is just simply less complicated and less huge. That's um, <laughs> uh, difficult to like answer generally, but um, if you look at our Yelp service principles, there's like, like it actually reasons about that. So I, I cannot like mention all of it, but I encourage you to check it out. It's actually like handles that topic. And um, if you want to talk more about this, like I will be at the booth now. There's also a bunch of uh, other awesome Yelp engineers there. So just come talk to us. We're happy to nerd out about this. Thank you again. Thank you.